Hello, good evening, and a very warm welcome to The Turning Point for ITN Sri Lanka. Turning Point is a daily discussion program, usually one-to-one, -one, and it's live between 6 and 6.30 p.m. on ITN Sri Lanka. And uh, we have a variety of guests, and um, ITN have taken this on, and we hope to explain matters, economic, and other things too. Let's see who our guest this evening is, shall we? And indeed, our guest this uh, evening is Mr. Duminde Hulangama, who is the chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, uh, the oldest one, I think 185 years. We'll find out, though. Good evening, Duminde. Thanks Good for coming. Good evening for us. Thank you very much for inviting. Thank you. 185 years old? Yes, yeah. for this Not year. Not you, but the... Yes, yeah. <laughs> obviously. Yeah. yeah, the Ceylon Chamber is uh, 185 years. Uh, we had the AGM uh, last month. It was okay. 185 years up to that point. Yes. And you represent uh, your membership is a cross section for all. Oh yes, businesses. definitely. So Ceylon Chamber, as I told, is the oldest chamber in Sri Lanka, hmm. and uh, we uh, represent a cross section of industry, from banking to manufacturing to uh, tourism to uh, multinationals, locals, mm -hmm. uh, power generation, healthcare. So we have a variety of uh, industries. And we have sectors, uh, we have 18 sectors in the, in the chamber uh, representing each industry. Uh, or if you take in the, in the economy from agriculture to exports to manufacturing to uh, financial services mm. to uh, pharmaceuticals, etc. Then on top of it, the Ceylon Chamber also has created the 23 business councils mm. uh, representing each, uh, most of the uh, countries with whom we trade. Mm. And uh, those business councils are under the chamber and they function separately, so they do all the trade promotion activities uh, between Sri Lanka and those countries. Excellent. So, uh, Dominda, you're, you're in, a, in a great position to tell me, uh, since our economic breakdown, if you like, um, in the last two years, how, how has corporate Sri Lanka done so far? Yeah, so for us, corporate Sri Lanka has uh, always been a very resilient force in the economy in Sri Lanka. Mm. Uh, not only the last two years, I think if you take from history's time that we were in school and we came out, we had the war, then we had the insurrection in 1989, uh, we went through the 30 year war thereafter. So I think it has gone through so many cycles of uh, uh, external disturbances mm. and the political turbulence and the private sector has survived and grown. Mm. So uh, of course the financial crisis that we faced in 2022 was uh, not like any other. Mm. I mean, even in the height of the war, uh, we had no restrictions on imports. Uh, we had no restrictions on foreign currency. Uh, we had no queues for fuel. We had no shortage of gas. Uh, we had no 13 hour power cuts. Mm. So, what we experienced in 2022 was uh, 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 hitherto an unprecedented collapse, uh, which Corporate Sri Lanka never faced before. We mm. never had a situation where companies couldn't uh, find foreign currency to import. Uh, we had a situation where uh, we had to stand in queues for petrol and, and diesel and mm. to, to fuel. I remember at the time of the crisis, uh, how the, the role that Ceylon Chamber played, we had to go uh, and um, discuss with uh, the ministries as to how we can get the fuel quotas to run our garment factories, mm. how we can get fuel quotas to run uh, the plantation industry, uh, because we had to keep the industry going and mm. the garment was in a quandary as to how they can uh, allocate resources between the uh, industry and consumers. Mm. So, I mean, what we faced in 22 was unlike any other situation before. So, so what, what, what would you, if you were to write a report card, how would you put it? Yeah, so I, was, I would say from where we were in 22 to now, uh, irrespective of uh, any political uh, uh, connotation to it, mm. uh, I think we have recovered significantly. I, I have been quite open about it, and I have, in fact, even every fora that I went to, mm. Uh, I have very clearly mentioned that the recovery that we made was phenomenal. Yeah. The stability we brought to the country, both politically and economically, was remarkable. However, having said that, it is a difficult path. And still, I think there are a lot to work to be done in the future as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the increase in taxes from 18 to 36 percent per personal tax, mm. uh, increase in VAT from 8 to 15 percent. Mm. Uh, 
uh, pricing fuel and electricity on cost plus basis mm. uh, were all part of the reform program which you had to do and it was very costly and contracted consumption. People even today are going through difficulties. Uh, but that is the only way that we have recovered. I mean, we have whatever recovery we have achieved thus far is because of the reform measures we have taken. Mm. And I believe that we have to continue on this path and this program. I don't think there's an alternative either. So, so when we look at uh, our taxation and so on, um, I suppose there have been unprecedented high levels. But this is that bitter medicine. And it looks like uh, the people have gotten used to this now. They've come to terms with it. So we're actually paying the right price for our fuel. Absolutely. And so on. And this years and years and years of um, subsidies yeah. does, Absolutely. doesn't work. Sri Lanka can't afford subsidies. That's right. So people, do you, would you suggest that people, looking at the economy and uh, all the numbers, that the people have got used to this? Well, I mean, they, are, they have no choice but to get used to it, yeah. put it that way. Because as you said, for us, uh, even us, never realized the economic problems uh, before 2018-19. Mm. Uh, you and I both, uh, I mean, my knowledge economy is not so much as what it is today mm. uh, because it was a learning process, right? Uh, we all lived on subsidies, not only the poor, you know, rich lived on subsidies. Uh, when you price fuel at 180 rupees or 120 rupees per liter, uh, we know the dollar fixed at 180 rupees mm. uh, to the dollar. Uh, we are not paying the actual price. I mean, we all merely imported cars, two or three cars. The permit schemes are rampant. I mean, all of us abuse the system, mm. Willing, wittingly, unwittingly both, mm. right? Uh, we all consume petrol. So we consumed all of our dollar reserves to, for consumption. And uh, so Sri Lanka can't look at what it was before uh, because we had realized that we were on subsidies. And that is the, the, the writing was on the wall for a long time that we'll have to face reality at some point of time. And we don't uh, really want to go the route of Bangladesh. Absolutely, absolutely. Of course, Bangladesh problems are different, right? Indeed. It's more to do with governance, etc. cetera. So, uh, so, so, so I think we need to be patient and uh, walk on this path, whoever comes, is my view. Excellent. Uh, and on that note, um, this is the turning point. Let's go for a short break. We'll be back with Mr. Duminda Hulangama the chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. And welcome back to the turning point we're in conversation with Mr. Duminda Hulangamu from the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce where he is the chairperson. Um, so Duminda, uh, we, the whole country from Tangol to Gaul to Dambulla, Jaffna, everywhere, Colombo as well, and to the hills, everywhere. Everyone's concerned about the economy, and taxes are up, the cost of living is up, and so on. But we, do we need to be fixed on this stabilized policy towards the road of recovery, these high taxes, whatever? Yeah, so uh, for us, people must. Uh realize and understand and it's our duty that's why we're going around the country at least uh, around in Colombo and talking to different fora is why the taxes are high. Hmm. Uh, it is very public servant uh, and similar groups who are saying the taxes are high. Uh, our total even at these high tax rates uh, our total tax revenue is about four trillion our total gamma revenue of which 90 percent is tax is four hmm. trillion the garment salaries and pensions is about one and a half trillion. Mm. Then we have to spend about the 1.2 trillion on subsidies. That is our special program, free health care, free education, and goods and services for the government, 1.2 trillion. So that, mm. that 2.7 trillion, 1.5, 1.2 trillion is not discretionary. There's no discretion. You, you've got to pay that. You have to pay that. Yeah. Of course, rationalization of public service is essential, but you can't do it overnight. You can't put them on the street the next day. Yeah. So there has to be a fair uh, policy on how to rationalize it over a period of time. So it'll take three, four years, five years to bring the service down. Mm. The next biggest expenditure is interest, mm. which is about domestic and foreign debt interest, about two and a half trillion. So of course, we have got a temporary holdover on the foreign debt. 
uh, and we hope that the debt restructuring will give some relief on the debt part. Uh, but still, it might be in the range of about two trillion, in my view, right? So when you put that two trillion, which is also non-discretionary, your entire income is taken off by those two expenditures. Mm. So Sri Lanka, where do you get? Then you have to borrow, or you have to print one mm. of the two. So we can't print our new bank yet, which is a very good thing. Limited printing is possible, but limited. And borrowing will increase interest rates, domestic borrowing. And that is a limited now. We can't go to international markets and borrow until the restructuring is over and our ratings are better. So where do we get the money then from, mm. right? So what we have to make sure is that the economy grows. If the economy grows, then people will get jobs. There will be more employment that you create. The more value addition create the economy. Mm. Through that, people will have more money in their hands. And that is the way forward. I, it might take some time, but that's only forward. Mm. Now, <coughs> so, uh, so Domingo, if we uh, look at it uh, slightly other way, whoever who comes in into the political arena, these debts are not going to no. go away. No. No way. We'll, okay, answer this in a slightly different way. Uh, because. You know, when Nelson Mandela became the first black president of South Africa, this is a big expectation that uh, people in, some people in Soweto thought, you know, they wouldn't have to pay their electric bills. He cut them off. Yeah. It was all cut off. Yeah. So in that way, do you think whoever comes in next will magically the prices will come no, down? No, no, no. I don't think that is a myth. I know that is possible. And yeah. I, I mean, we are in conversation with all political parties, and I think they are all responsible, and they should be responsible for what they are doing. We have learned the lesson enough. Uh, so so if they you want you to need cut, a plan. Yeah, so even if you cut the, for example, if someone wants to cut the electricity bill, yeah. how can you finance it? Now, what we did all this time, I'll just give an example. What happened when the electricity was not charged to the consumers at market? Of course, there's inefficiency and cost. I'm, I'm talking about without that, right? Yeah. Still, we are selling, even if you take that bit off, we are selling below cost. Mm. So where was the petroleum corporation loss? And the electricity board lost parked the People's Bank and Bank of Ceylon. Mm. Because the government gave guarantees for the loss, for the money that they can't recover. When they have reached the uh, top of the guarantee where they can't get any more guarantees, the debt is the loss is parked in Bank of Ceylon and People's Bank. Mm. And those two banks become viable. And whose money do those banks have? People's money. Mm. So they, anywhere they pay, right? Yeah. So so that's what I said. So if you want to cut the cost to the people, you have, if you don't have sufficient income to support it, you have to borrow. Mm -hmm. So if you borrow, you increase interest rates. Plus, you also increase inflation. Mm -hmm. So people will pay either way. So you might have 8% tax rate, mm -hmm. but you have inflation 25% probably, or interest at 20%. So you so pay either way. Yeah. So, so really, to sort this out, we've come some distance now, two years. We need a plan. Absolutely. And the plan needs time. Yeah. I think the plan is already there. Mm. Uh, I don't think anyone can walk away from the plan, in my view. Mm. The, we have had extensive discussions with the IMF uh, as a Ceylon chamber in trying to see some relief you can give on taxation. Uh, I can't see any space for any discussion. If at all, they'll try to increase it if they can. Uh, because for us to be debt sustainable, so we have to first become a debt sustainable country. Mm. We must show IMF that with our income, minus expenses, we can service our debt. Mm. So until such time, that guarantee and the assurance can be given to the IMF, they don't accept our debt restructuring plan. So if we can't accept the restructuring plan of the IMF, we become internationally non-tradable again. So we need, therefore, to make sure that we walk on this path. I mean, it's very difficult, unfortunate, it's tough. Mm. I mean, people might find fault with saying this, but I'm telling the truth to the people, that you have to walk this path, whoever comes, unless there's a country of some donor is willing to give you $15 billion and say, chum here, close the matter. Mm. But I don't think you're going to give $15 billion no. and say you're closed chapter. Not even Elon Musk. Yeah, no one can do no that, one. right? So, so unfortunately to Sri Lanka, that's why I always say this is not one man's mission. Mm. This is the mission of the entire country. All of us must walk on this path, and all of us must be shareholders in this resurrection process. It's difficult, tough. Greece took 10 years. In my view, for us to go through this, it'll take time. The biggest risk I see is the political risk, that the political parties towards elections should not be promising things they cannot do. Uh, we have engaged political parties, and we feel that they are convinced of the path, 
and that they should not is my view and create hope that things that they cannot do so mm. so that is the most important thing is that we walk on this path and I mean you might have to tweak it here and there but oh, substantially you can't do anything no. much right so you have to walk on this path is what I feel and um, do you feel that uh, uh, when you look at it from the chamber's eyes do you feel that the government is doing everything that they can to let this economy grow like in tourism which is you know all the infrastructure in place anyway uh, do you think they're doing enough or well, is well I mean I mean there are I mean there are I mean, since you mentioned tourism there are a few things that the visa issue I, I really don't know tell you Frank I mean industry says and the chamber also issued a statement on this that we must revisit this visa thing and whether it has really affected the uh, what you call the number of tourists who come mm. uh, but either way I think there are improvements you can make in, in some areas but by and large I think the chamber feels that we have to follow this path mm. right uh, but you can tweak things here and there uh, of course, there are improvements you can make on governance, law and order. I mean, mm. those are things that uh, that needs improvement because the outside perception is depending on based on those. Because when an investor looks at Sri Lanka as a whole, look at governance, you look at law and order as well. In in addition to other statistics, so mm. I think all together everything must be put in place. But of course, it's not easy, right? Mm. We are in this country for the last so many years. You know, you can't put things right overnight, especially subcontinental politics. So we have to be aware of certain inherent features will continue. Whoever comes in mind, mm. but the broader sense. The economic plan, uh, we need to make sure that this goes beyond this because for us, it's not over yet. We are not still finalizing the debt restructuring. I hope it will happen very soon. Mm. Uh, we need to do the public sector reform. Yeah. When I say public sector reform, I'm referring to not sale of SOEs, but I'm taking real public sector reforms. Yeah. The need for certain public departments, the same numbers of staff that we had in the past. Mm. How do we bring efficiency into this place? How do we digitalize? So the ch chamber is in a, in a big program to see how we can get the digitalization program done. Mm. If the digitalization of the IT car project takes place, then that will cut across so many sectors and you can reduce so many layers of staff, so many layers of garment delivery mm. can happen without going to offices, without going wasting time with public servants, you can have a lot of delivery done. So a lot of efficiency can be brought in. So you can then cut the layers in the public sector in, much, in my view. and bring a better service to us. So we have to get the whole thing might take a lot of time, mm. but that whole holistic view of looking at it critically is important whoever comes. Excellent, thank you. And um, can you hazard a guess? If you're going in this path, how many years? No, I think this might take about, uh, I mean the recovery itself might take about five years is my view, mm -hmm. right? I mean we'll go on this path, we'll grow three, four, five percent I think. But if you can give confidence to the international community that Sri Lanka is stable yeah. on macroeconomic fundamentals like yeah. inflation, interest rates, uh, that if uh, foreign exchange uh, reserves, see the prediction is that we can build the reserves to about $15 billion by 28. Yeah. So if you go on that path and we uh, consolidate from where we are rather than try to reverse. And you know, Sri Lanka is very famous for uh, taking one step forward and two steps back, mm -hmm. right? So you don't do that again. And we've done that many a time, right? Mm. So we have lived through the last 30 years. So I hope if that doesn't happen, if everyone is committed that this is our country and my country and let's forget our differences and try to see if we can take this forward. I think that is a unified effort because people also need direction. If people, if political parties are uh, uh, not decisive and they're divisive mm. as a result, they divide amongst themselves, then people follow them. So I think in one voice, we need to talk. That's why, for example, this launch chamber launched the Vision 2030 document. Mm. which gives uh, the, the policies that the government should adopt mm. in every sector mm. to achieve macroeconomic stability by 2030. Yeah. The ex reserves, uh, reserves that we should have, the growth rates we should achieve, exchange rates, so all those targets are given for whichever government comes into power to be achieved by 2030, the report card. Yeah. And we gave the vision to achieve that. And that we shared with all three political parties, especially the president, the SJB, and the NPP. Our, our whole idea was to bring uh, bipartisan on economic matters. Mm. We should not divert economic matters. And I'm sure all of them accepted it in principle. Now we, we, we need to, um, uh, the customs uh, is missing a lot of revenue because people aren't bringing cars in. Now there's some sort of move to try and relax that. Wouldn't that add to our problems? Wouldn't that add pressure to our well, foreign it, it, it will, it will, but at some point we are being normality to the whole place, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think the issue is uh, in my view, even if you open cars for imports, the demand will not be as much what it used to be six, mm. seven years ago. Mm. People had the permit, 
concession duty free. And then at 180 rupees a dollar you brought. So today, the same car that you bought for 100 rupees in 2018 will cost you 200 rupees. Hmm. So people don't have money to buy because of the taxation and other issues that we discussed. The cost of living has gone up, so people's spending power is limited. So I don't mm. think even if you open it for us, there will be a floodgate. I mean, there will be pent-up demand at the beginning, but it will settle in my view. And um, do you think it's time to return to that normality? I think gradually we'll have to get into that, is my view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think they'll cross a big dent to the reserves, uh, because people also will not buy in the same way that they bought earlier. So there will be pent-up demand. I'm assuming there are a few people who, are, I mean, who can afford to buy at high prices, so they will buy. But it will not be the same proportion and size as what it was before, is my view. So we, 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 we touched on Bangladesh a uh, little bit. We, we borrowed money from Bangladesh. And now we see uh, this awful situation in Bangladesh. Um, is there a danger that if we don't follow this path, the plan that we're going on now, that we might just have to go back to those dark old days, dirty oh yeah. our power cuts and so Oh, yeah. So, so if we relax on what we have done, so, like, for example, why can the government supply fuel now? Uninterrupted is because they're setting up market prices. So CEPC is not doing losses. We able to because the stability we brought in, we able to uh, get the remittances back into the country, especially the Middle East remittances. So with that, we have the reserve. So I think if we uh, try to reverse these things, my fear is that we might, we may go back to the dark ages again, and we should prevent it. That's a frightening thought. Yeah. Uh, Dominda Hulangamu, thank you very much for being thank on the you. program today. Thank, thank you. you. That's the way it was on uh, the turning point for ITN Sri Lanka. Take care and see you again Monday to Friday, 6 to 6.30 p.m., usually live.